So welcome to Royal Museums Greenwich for the second of our talks on rebel women, female pirates as we celebrate Women's History Month. I'm Elle McCurran. I have short bleached hair, blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm wearing glasses and at this moment a headset. And I'm sitting in the office of the National Maritime Museum. And you can see there's a, a life boy behind me and even a polar bear. This evening, we salute the fascinating life of Zhang Yi Sao, also known as Ching Zi, and most, the most powerful pirate of all time. And I'm delighted to have a panel of experts along to take this deep dive into her amazing life story. Joining me this evening are Diane Murray, Professor Emeritus at the University of Notre Dame and author of The Origin of the, and I'm going to not say this properly, sorry, The Origin of Tian Di Hu and Pirates of the South China Coast, 1790 to 1810. Uh, we also uh, have Professor Ronald Poe, Associate Professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science and author of The Blue Frontier, Maritime Vision and Power in the Qing Empire. Hi, Ron, how are you doing? Hi, Hi. thanks for having me here today. I'm doing very well. I'm very well, much looking forward to this discussion today. Brilliant. Um, and we have Elaine Becker, uh, best-selling author of more than 90 books for children and young adults, including Pirate Queen, A Story of Jiang Isao. Hi, Helene, how are you doing? Oh, great. It's lovely to be with you. I wish I were with you in person today. It's well, you are in, you're in Ontario. That's right. That's we're right. On the other side of the sea. <laughs> and I believe you have even got something with you there in case anyone gets out of hand. Yes. <laughs> you know, when you're a children's writer, there is no shame and no pride. You know, we have fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And hopefully uh, Diane will um, pop on her uh visuals and we'll be able to see her and hear her there she is Diane how are you doing this evening I'm happy to be here thank you great Fine. looking forward to this are you in a nice clement weather there I think you're in South Carolina I'm in South Carolina the daffodils are blooming it was 86 yesterday and uh, I'm about four minutes from the ocean it's cooler today and, and, and rainy but we're fighting pollen while many of my American neighbors are fighting snow. So we'll I'll okay. take pollen. <laughs> I'll take pollen too, I would. Uh, and we also have my colleague Ho, who is uh, going to do and uh, work the Zoom for us this evening. So thank you, Ho. Um, before we set sail on this voyage of discovery, let me just add that there will be a Q&A at the end. Um, so please do add any questions or comments that you have in the chat box, and I'll be able to field them to my panel later. And the first thing, just before we start, really, I want to ask everybody this. Maybe I go to Diane first. How did you first encounter uh, Zhang Yisao and what were your first impressions of her? Diane. I have no idea. I can't remember. It was 45 <laughs> years ago or more. Um, it, it probably was in the course of reading about the, the larger confederation or the larger group of pirates. And all I remember is I did not seek her out. She came sailing to me. I, I had no idea that there was going to be a woman pirate or, or that, you know, she was going to lead a confederation at some point. So, um, so I'm afraid I'm, I'm striking out already on this because <laughs> I just, I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's Grant. Uh, Helene, yourself, how did you so find I, out? I do remember because it was a very specific thing. So as a, as a writer, I focus on all kinds of different things. I write fiction, nonfiction, humor, all kinds of things. But one particular area that I'm very interested in is stories of women that have not been told because, well, there's so many of them and often they're very good. And I've been a pissy feminist my whole life. I have two children and they both know this. I would whisper into their cribs, you know, when they were babies, girls are smarter than boys. Girls are smarter than boys, you know, All that kind of thing. So they were, you know, well-trained feminist boys. So when my son, Michael, was old enough to actually be functional, he um, acted as a research assistant with, with me on this book, Counting on Catherine, or what was the predecessor to this. And um, it's the story of Katherine Johnson, who was an American mathematician who suffered 
sexism and racism and saved Apollo 13 when it exploded. So she brought them home. And, she, you know, funny, she wasn't in the movie, right? Like she never got any credit. That made me angry. So it was like, this is a story I have to tell. So while he was doing research, he knows what I like, you know, and he sent me another uh, text saying, oh, mom, I've got somebody else you're really going to like, because he really knew. And it was Zhang Zi. And uh, I was like, you are so right. You are so right. This is my, my kind of gal, especially yeah. because I have an alter ego. As a child, I was a pirate and I was Lady Pink. That is my pirate name. <laughs> but I don't see why, you know, and I loved that um, Liz Wong, who's the illustrator of the book, she put our pirate queen in pink without even any input from me because it's just like made to happen. Made to happen. Lovely. So you, you, your son found her out for you and discovered her. Lovely. What about yourself, Ron? Yeah. Hi. Well, that's that's a fantastic story. And well, <laughs> for for me, uh, well, I I remember I I first encountered her from from a primary school trip. I mean, when when our teacher in Hong Kong, I mean, brought us to to an island called mm -hmm. called Long Island. I mean, it's called Changzhou in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And w w one of the features, I mean, of this island is that mm -hmm. there, there is a tourist spot. I'm sure Diane have heard of it. Um, there's a tourist spot to the southwestern part of the island called Zhang Bao Zai Cave. And, and it, it wasn't my first time to heard of Zhang Bao Zai I mean, back then in that mm -hmm. school trip, but, but it was my first time to, to come across the name of Zhang Yi Sao. Because, uh -huh. because, because uh, at the end of the trip, I mean, my, my teacher told us that, well, I mean, uh, Zhang Yi Sao got married to Zhang Bao Zai. But, but at the same time, she was her adoptive mother. And so, well, as, as a 10 year old back then, I, I, I think I was about 10 years old. And I, I, I was shocked. I was like, I was like, what happened to this couple? And, but, but at the same time, I, I also find it very intriguing. So, so that's why I decided to, to find out more about uh, um, Zhang Yisao and Zhang Baozai. And that was my first encounter with her. Ah, oh, so you were only 10. <laughs> that's good. I so, was 10. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we're, we're talking about her now. And she was, and I, and I believe she still is, the most successful pirate of all time. And when you compare to celebrated male pirates, the likes of Blackbeard, who had maybe several hundred men and maybe 10 to 15 ships. And the same, you know, when I did one on Anne, uh, Bunny and Reed last year in the Caribbean, you know, they had, they were successful pirates, but they're, they're, tenure let's say was quite short and they didn't have this but like uh, uh Zhang Yisao had as many as 400 vessels and an estimated 70,000 men that's mm -hmm. incredible um and importantly I like as well that the fact that unlike many pirates she had a very comfortable later life so let's take a deep dive with our panel and hear about the incredible achievements of this pirate um just for anyone to participating, watching now. These are the three books that I mentioned earlier. Um, so maybe perhaps uh, Diane or Rod, you could maybe set the scene for us in terms of the socio-political landscape in China in the late 1700s. Um, and which part of China are we talking about? So what was going on? Who'd like to kick off? I guess I can. We're yeah. talking about the yeah. south, southeastern part of China in the area that uh, uh, today would be uh, Guangzhou and um, mm. Hong Kong and Macau, which form a kind of a triangle. And mm. at that time, and and then the and then the waters uh, to the uh, to the southwest that extend into Vietnam or to the border of Vietnam. And at that point in time, my take on it, and, and Ron can chip in, is that uh, it, there was a very uh, land shortage in China. Population density was increasing. People were being pushed off the land. People were having trouble finding employment. And, and so uh, there was created off the shore of many of these coastal enclaves, uh, water worlds where uh, boat people would live their entire lives mm. and some of them without set 
and foot on land. And this was a pariah group. They were barred from the official access. The males were barred from official access to government service. And they differed from the onshore society. In part, uh, women did not bind their feet. And it was quite common for women to be seen on the kind of vessels that would go between the various villages and would go between mm. some of the boats. So. Um, yeah, yeah, great. Ron, do you want to add some more in there? Yeah, yeah surely, surely. Yeah, I, I agree totally with what Diane just said. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, I mean, the Qing Empire uh, at the end of the 18th century was was facing a lot of problems and, and challenges. And as Diane already mentioned, that the rapid population growth is one of the problems. And in, in addition to these, like I would say, internal problems, there were also some other like external problems. Like, uh, for example, there was a like, uh, local, uh, uh, local re revolt and rebellions across China, and also some other uh, sporadic attacks by Mongol tribes to the north mm -hmm. of the country. Um, and there were also some problems of climate change and which led to the problems of like, for example, soil uh, uh, degradations across most parts of China. So, so the Qing Empire was clearly in, in a dilemma, I would say, I mean, which had quite a lot on its plate at the turn of the 18th century. And, and I also want to add that, I mean, dealing with these internal instability was, was time consuming and actually quite costly. Right. And to finance it, the government would need to raise taxes and import duties, I mean, which hurt the merchants of Guangdong particularly uh, uh, and mm. the coastal region of South China uh, because they were rich enough to pay the tax. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And I wonder as well, because um, it was a Confucian, Confucian society which was quite male orientated uh, at the time for women, what was their place in society if you weren't from the elite? Mm. Even if tough. you were, you're even playing. if you were, it was tough. Well, it was it, 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 the idea was everybody in society had a role to play, and everybody knew what their position and their role was. And a woman was to, in her youth, be obedient mm. to her father, in her marriage to her husband, and in her uh, dowagership to her eldest son. And women were supposed to be mainly in the home and not out gadding about. And so um, it was a rather restricted livelihood. And, and most of the women in, in, the, in the Chinese mainland, the Han Chinese uh, would have had brown mm. feet at that time. It, they, they could get around, mm. but um, they weren't gonna be running marathons with crippled feet. And so that was a, a factor as well. Okay, so it sounds like there was a, a lot going on uh, in terms of like, you can see why there was maybe the piracy started to happen. There's a lot of maybe unrest if people were hungry and poor. Um, oh, was... I think piracy started, piracy had been happening for a long time mm -hmm. and piracy for decades, years on and off was a, a, a nuisance phenomenon. It was a seasonal phenomenon. Most of the pirates were fishermen and oh. fishing is a seasonal pastime. Um, you can only fish about half the year. And so in, in cycle with the monsoons, when the fishing was not good, these people were still in debt. Uh, you have to have uh, you, you can't be self-sufficient and be a fisherman. You have to buy nets, you have to buy tackle, you have to, you, you, you have, to have outside you know, um, supplies. And so to pay their debts, they would then become part-time pirates and they would go up mm. the coast and, and they would raid and then they would come back. And, you know, there were maybe a junk or a, a vessel or two, 13, 20, 25 men, and they just slip back into society and, and life would go on. So that phenomenon never stopped. But what happened in this case was something that turned the table and made it big time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that's yep. quite an interesting idea, uh, Ron, I guess. The <laughs> fact I would never have thought people were part time pirates like. You yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh, really like the job. idea of, <laughs> yeah, I really like the idea of part time pirates as well. And, and uh, yeah. there's, absolutely, there's like a seasonal job. Because, yeah. um, <laughs> and, and even like for some pirate part-time pirates, I mean, because they even have multiple identities. For example, in daytime, I mean, they were just normal businessmen. They were okay. soldiers. I mean, they were sailors on board. But in the in the nighttime, <laughs> because they had to make a living, I mean, they become they dress like pirates. I mean, they become pirates. They transform themselves to become a pirate. So there's really a fascinating idea. 
It is. It's what great. In the South China Sea stays in the South China Sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I if, if I may, I, like I just sure. want to like quickly add to what Diane mm-hmm. just said about yeah. the, the the role for women. Mm-hmm. I, I was it was actually a very difficult time for mm-hmm. for for women in Guangdong, especially those from the lower class or uh, lower class or on living on the fringe of the society, because who were clearly isolated like socially, culturally, and also economically. I mean, from the power structure of mm-hmm. local and national government. And and as you mentioned earlier, that I mean, it was the Qing Empire was still very much a a male oriented Confucian society. So that it means women didn't really have the chance to take part in the civic examinations. I mean, even though we know that there were some talented women, I mean, for some reason, such studies suggest that there were some talented women who also wrote poetry, who were um, very like 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 uh, yeah, who produced like writings. I mean, like beautifully, uh, but. As a matter of fact, is that I mean they still didn't really have the chance to climb up the so-called ladder of success in a proper way, um, so that like most of them had no choice but to work in the shadow market, assist mm-hmm. in smugglings and, and in human trafficking, I mean particularly in Guangdong, and or, or or to work in brothels. I mean as sex workers. So so therefore, I think it was not just the male who were suffering. I mean, from the economic dearth or the lack of opportunities. I mean, at the end of the 18th century, but but also the women from the lower class uh, in Guangdong. Great. Um, we we know very little about her early years, and we don't actually really even know when she was born. Um, is that correct? We don't know what year, but around. So, um, do you know? Yeah, it is. It is correct. I mean, we know relatively little about her. I think mean, as to most of the eminent pirates, I mean, we didn't really know much about their childhood, right? Um, because they sort of they have a have a have a blurry background. But but yeah, so you're right. We know relatively little about her her childhood. Probably born about 1775. 1775 yeah. around that. More, point. I mean, yeah. more or less, but yeah. Um. So, I mean, piracy, like you said, there was lots of different reasons for it um, and it doesn't operate in a vacuum. Um, So when did it start? I know there's a time when they got involved in Vietnam. There was a Vietnamese sort of peasant uprising. What happened with the piracy at that point? And did it grow? Uh, Yeah, that was the turning point. That's what that's what turned part time piracy into what would ultimately be professional piracy in in the South China Sea. It was a rebellion in Vietnam. The Vietnamese rebels became emperors. Um, Their uh, suzerainty was contested. They didn't have a navy, and and a lot of of the uh, problem was coming from the sea. They didn't have a navy, and so the short term answer was to recruit Chinese pirates to become their privateers. Right. And this gave uh, to these part time pirates a safe haven. It gave them a base of operation. It gave them protection. It also enabled them to learn to work together and to cooperate and to meet one another. And so as a result of serving in Vietnam from roughly, well, 17 probably the late 1700s, 1780, 1792, until 18 um, you know, piracy increased significantly. Uh, gangs of maybe 30, 40, 50 vessels and three, 400 men uh, superseded the, the small operations of the petty pirates. And so uh, that's, that, that, that was the point that enabled piracy to really shift in, in the Southeast. Okay. Um, and so when do we, like, I think is it um, when the Vietnamese, when that stopped and they went back to China, where did they become, um, did they sort of stop being privateers and go away from the government or what happened? Like, I think it's around 1802. 1802, their, their yeah. protectors in Vietnam are defeated. And at that point, they're too big to just melt back into the Guangdong. <laughs> society. And so they fight each other for a while, um, mm-hmm. you know, because there were several different groups that were down there. And those leaders, you know, went back and, and they behaved badly <laughs> toward each other. And towards, and then um, probably about three or four years later, somewhere 1804, 1805, they realized that 
it, their best interest lay in confederation. And so they uh, wrote up a contract, uh, seven pirate leaders signed it, and they agreed to join forces and to create cooperation rather than uh, competition in terms of their scouring of the South China Sea. And is, uh, so Raul, is this maybe the, around the time that um, she met, that Zheng, uh, that Zheng Yisao met her husband, who was, what was his story, actually? Yeah, well, yeah, her first husband, <laughs> her first, yes, husband, first husband, Zhang Yi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so according to, to some historical records, um, they met in a floating brothel in Guangdong because uh, mm -hmm. Zhang Yi Sao, as, uh, as like some other women, has been living on the fringe of society, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, they were, they were forced to employ it as a sex worker in one of these brothels at that time. Um, but, but unlike most of the workers there, uh, I think Zhang Yi Zhao was already quite famous uh, before she met Zhang Yi. Uh, uh, as she already had developed a, a, a reputation as a savvy businesswoman, uh, uh, trading pillow talk secrets with wealthy clients. <laughs> it's impressive, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so I, I guess it's perhaps it's because of this as dim the reputations. And I also assume that also because of her beauty, um, uh, Jiang Yi, uh, the pirate leaders, as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, purportedly sought out Jiang Yi Sao and offered her marriage and eventually invited her to join the uh, join him in the life of piracy, but 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 there is another version of the story actually, which, which goes <laughs> like Zhang Yi Zhao was the one who sought Zhang Yi out specifically, oh. and persuaded him to marry her. Uh, I, I I also find this version quite convincing actually because. If we could refer to what I just briefly mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. like this type of marriage is a kind of beneficial marriage, uh, right. actually represented one of the paths to upward mobility for lower class women in Chinese society. So that, therefore some historians I mean, have argued that like Zhang Yi Sao's marriage to, to the pirate leader was a self-conscious act and also a deliberate attempt. Well, okay, you said, yeah, she was savvy. I mean, if she was working um, on the floating flower brothels, I mm. mean, maybe she, you know, checked out who was the best bet there and he sounded like a good bet. Um, <laughs> it sounds like, um, but she also made a pact with him. She didn't just marry him. She got, she, she made a pact to say half and half is yours or something like that. Diane. I'm not sure that we have evidence. Oh, we that. don't. So this may be just part of the. Uh... I mean, maybe I, I, I have no evidence of that. Let's put okay. it that way. My, but, but yours may have. But mine, <laughs> mine, there's no evidence. <laughs> Well, but, we don't, I'm, but this yeah. is far more than we know about her. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe, but I assume that she might do a PowerPoint presentation, so you know, on the <laughs> to say that, oh, please marry me because I have all these like <laughs> capabilities, A, B, C, and D. So, come on, you have to. Yeah. <laughs> she worked. She worked anything. her. She, yeah, she worked her um, everything that she had and, and got a, a husband who had who was quite yeah. powerful. Um, so, mm. Helen, if we move to you for a sec, uh, your beautifully illustrated work of historical fiction, which is The Pirate Queen, a story of Zheng Yisao, and the illustrations by Liz Wong. Beautiful, yeah. It's written in the first person narrative, and I wonder why you chose that. Uh, I didn't actually choose it, it ah. chose me, which is ah. often what happens with works of creativity. I mm -hmm. fell in love with her story or stories, as there were so many, and uh, they spin around in your head. And, you know, that is, as a writer, I'm not an academic, so I want things to be as accurate as possible because that is my background. That's what I do. But preeminently, it's story. It's what is going to attract a reader and keep a reader going mm -hmm. through. So I was thinking about it. It spins around in your head in one night. The first line of the book, which is, I had never dreamed of the sea, it just came to me and it was in her voice. Um, if I may, can I? Yeah, I'll, please. I'll read yeah. just the, the first page because okay. this came to me exactly like that. It did not change a single word <laughs> anywhere from that first moment. So, and you think, wow, that feels like magic because you feel like, you know, you know, you're not channeling somebody else, it's going through you. 
but it's taking all of the things that you've learned and interpreting it to make a story. So it starts out like this, and it's a beautiful picture there of the ship. It goes like this. I never dreamed of the sea. I never, not in my wildest imaginings, fancied myself a pirate queen. But fortune cares nothing for your dreams. She takes up your life in her cup and shakes it so hard, your teeth rattle in your head and your heart roars like a dragon in your chest. Then she throws the bones onto her table of lacquer and jade. Your fate is sealed. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I wonder as well, as your book is written for children and young adults, how do you explain that she started as a sex worker and the floating brothels? Or do you skirt over these parts? Uh, well, I had to do that. And <laughs> I love this part about how she married her stepson and, and all that, because so I, I just I you skirt over it because, you know, so it just the first scene mm -hmm. is so there. I sat combing my hair. It doesn't say she's in a brothel but you get the idea that she's a young woman and it talks about girls such as me who are the dregs of society who are used up and used up and used like they were ink but then she decides she can write her own scroll so it's a I sort of poeticize it away to to give you that forward momentum and more details are in the author's note because uh, I like kids all readers to understand what's made up you know, because you don't know the facts, there are no, there's no information. I mean, pirates don't keep diaries, right? They, yes. They, they don't do that. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, shame. there's always a, a bit of connecting the dots. And <clears throat> I know when we were kids, that didn't usually happen in the books that we read. People would just write a story and you wouldn't know that they, you know, George Washington chopped down a cherry tree. They just made that up. They didn't tell you that. And right. so what we do now, what's the standard practice in children's books is to let kids understand, let them know what you did, how you found out your information, what is real, what is embroidered, what you don't know, you know, so that they can make their own intelligent decisions and not wind up with a completely crazy story in their head that then they have to unlearn later. Okay, so you've got the facts. So it doesn't matter about the gaps in her story, like as Diane was saying earlier, like there is a lot we don't know um i think ron had mentioned it as well so there's lots of things like we said on the internet on youtube um and when i was reading and researching for this um there were so many things and i think i i put some in diane said no that's not true and yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of myths so people can do it but in your particular uh, book how, so how do you fill the gaps you just you can write them in and then you explain at the back that this is fact and this well, is Well, you know, what we tried to do, and, and Diane was so kind, she fact-checked the book, and you try to find the line where you are making something up because you don't have the information, yeah. but that it used to the facts that you do know, so that you could say, well, we don't know for sure that this happened, but based on the pieces of information we have, it could go this way, or it could be that way. I mean, there's many, many options. Like what was going through her head? Did she seek him out and marry him? How did she do it? Did she do it you know, um, uh, very overtly? You know, I'll march up to the ship and say, hey, marry me. Or did she seduce him? Or, you know, did she just take advantage of the situation? We don't know. So you could tell the story in all of those ways. Right. With I mean, I <clears throat> one more false than the other. Sure. I mean, I like Ron's idea of her having a PowerPoint and saying, this is why you should marry me, because I've got all this stuff. I, I like that idea. Um, so getting back to that, how did they unify the pirates? Uh, herself and her husband obviously were in charge and, and, and begin their dominance of the sea. Somehow they realigned with the uh, pirate heads who had been active in Vietnam. I mean, almost to a one, the, there were, there were, well, there were probably a dozen fleets that were active at the time. And I just sort of reread part of my stuff and realized that some of them surrendered or quit at, at the time of the Confederation. And there were seven that were still remaining and they signed this contract. And I think that it probably took a lot of persuasion. It took a lot of cooperation. And what that did was it, 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 it didn't talk about personal con 
conduct within the Confederation, but it was very concerned about creating a unified force how you have every ship, every ship has to be registered with a fleet, it has to have a number, it has to have a flag. And then within that, who makes, who, who gets to keep the proceeds? And right. they specifically said, if you, you know, are the first ship to attack, it's yours, but if somebody attacks it and takes it away from you, then they have to indemnify you for what they lost. So there was a whole section on that. But the most important thing to me that comes out of this is the fact that these guys are not living by heists at sea. They are living because they have regular financial uh, means and income. And that income comes from selling protection. So this means if they are successful, and they were enforcing every uh, fishing boat, every commercial boat, every salt vessel that left, leaves port to buy documents of protection. Now, if a vessel mm. does that and gets attacked by some, you know, outlying pirate or somebody who's not playing by the rules, yeah. there's going to be trouble. And so it much of this confederation is also dedicated to how those kinds of attacks will be recompensed and how the perpetrators will be punished. So that, and then, and then there was the rec, uh, recognition that not every branch or every group or every fleet is gonna be equally successful. And so mm -hmm. how the, the proceeds are gonna be split across the-, the Right, the, yeah, because obviously some People might be out for a drink for the night. Some pirates might think, oh, maybe I'll go back to fish. They mightn't be on it. And so they're going to not be doing as well as the people who are who are like pirate number one or whatever on the boat. Or they could just get beat, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it happens. You, you could just yeah. be defeated. And, uh, you know, yeah, there I mean, are risks. It sounds like a bit like, um, well, I think of the Sopranos, but just that a protection uh, racket. I mean, That's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> and not only turf war. <laughs> turf war. Yeah, because it's not like even that they were just doing it on sea. As you said, they were doing it inland as well mm -hmm. after a while. Ron? Yes, they were. They were. They were also like just not on the land. And, and they also like, like actually most of their bases were, were in inland were like coastal cities. So they were not like, because we we're always under the impression that I mean, pirates do live on, on, a, on a remote island or they would hide everything I mean, in a cave whatsoever. But when the actuality, I mean, they, they have to sow their booties I mean, as soon as they uh, are still with some, somebody or, or just like, um, yeah, so they, most of their bases were actually in big coastal cities like Canton. Okay. Macau. Um, Macau. And Macau, yeah, exactly. Macau was played very big in that, in that whole scene. So yep. she was so she was married for about I think was it like around six years or something and then maybe 1807 he died her husband mm -hmm. died mm -hmm. um, and then what happened she managed to run things um, and become pirate queen or am I just skipping there. No she apparently seems I mean again it's the inner workings are not uh, laid bare but she right. probably first went to his relatives and secured their uh, you know, uh, loyalty. Okay. And there were a lot of them. I mean, one pirate surrendered uh, and brought, you know, 50 relatives with him. So, I mean, these, that wasn't the Jones, that was, that was somebody else, but, but there were large family units that were also in these, in these fleets. And so she did that. And then she um, seems to have been able to convince the other, you know, the non, the non-familial, uh, colleagues to stay with her and then mm -hmm. um and then probably appointing uh John Bao to be her lieutenant and, and raise him up through the ranks probably was a stroke of genius he seems to have he seems to have been a very able uh commander and leader and seems to have actually you know been very active in running the whole show so just to go back who um for our listeners watchers can you tell us who Zhang Bao was Zhang Bao was the son of a fisherman. And Zhang Bao uh, was probably in his early teens at the time he and his father were fishing. He was captured by uh, Zhang Yi, um, Madame Zheng's husband. And he had potential to become a, 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 good, a good pirate. Uh, he was eventually made captain of a ship. He was brought into the Confederation. And uh, we don't know, all the reasons, but um, 
he was finally adopted by uh, Zheng Yi as an adopted son. Uh, and this is this was uh, done because in those days, if you if businesses and 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 economic enterprises were based on family connections, yeah. and so to 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 pave the way, you need a family connection. And so, adult or adolescent adoption in in South China or in China was not unheard of. Mm. And so, I think that was the reason for that was to facilitate them being partners and to seal that kind of a bond. And so that 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 was the adopted son bit. And then, yeah. you know, by the time Zheng Yi died, he, uh, Zhang Bao had, you know, had proved his worth. And so she moved him up the ranks. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, sure. I also want to add that, like, according yeah. to some private writings in the chain, like Zhang Bao Zai was also very good looking, like, oh, like yeah. very masculine very handsome. And so this is something that it might also lead to the marriage, I mean, like between him and Zhang Yi Sao later, after Zhang Yi dies. Okay, because it sounds like yeah. the first thing, oh, adopted son, that's a bit weird, but actually he's not related to her. And if he's a handsome, striking, strapping young guy with the sword in his hand or whatever, and, you know, wits about him, you know, she was she was onto a good thing, I guess. So who- We're charming, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we see her military progress, I guess. And you mentioned earlier something about like the extra revenue as well. It's salt. You mentioned salt commodity. Like, why was that important? Salt was a big thing back then, or it was salt was a of... huge deal. It, right, uh, as in France, in traditional China, salt was a government gabelle. It was a tax-run operation, mm -hmm. and the production, uh, distribution, sale of salt was all controlled by the government, and it was. It was taxed, I, as I understand it, at every level. So the right to, you know, the right to create a salt pan probably was paid for, and then the production, and then the salt. There were 22 salterns in Guangdong at that time. Most of them were kind of in the southwest, uh, not too far from Vietnam. And uh, uh, four times a year, uh, the fleets would gather, and they would. I think it was what a 400 mile journey uh, by sea from the Lajo Peninsula to Canton. And so they bring mm -hmm. the salt there and then it would be distributed throughout China or throughout South China. And so if you could command the salt and there was always salt smuggling. I mean, that was a, that was going on all the time but if you could command those ships and get them to pay you, um, you know, you, you do okay. So that was, that was the reason that salt was such a high, uh, highly prized government commodity. Right. And do, do we know what they were doing with their money and their looting and stuff? Like, where were they putting it? How was it, you know, were they just storing it or just living large? What, how, you know, what were they doing with their booty? I don't think they were living large um, because some of the British captives talk about the food on board you know, caterpillars and delicate white mice or mice. Ooh, and, okay. Um, but so that's one side, but the other side is there were reports, and I don't remember exactly where, but talking about the amount of cash that was on board the pirate vessels. And, and in fact, just a few minutes ago, I was trying to see how much of this I, I could store up again. And I read that at one point after, uh, at near the end of the Confederation, when surrender was, was being discussed, there was a breakdown and the pirates resumed their activity. And in one day they captured a, a Western ship and got three chests worth of silver tails, several tens of thousands of them. So, um, mm -hmm. so I, I can believe that. And, and I mean, think about it. If you're going to have several hundred, I mean, several tens of thousands of men or even several thousand men, you've got to, you know, you've got to provision them. And, and that's going to take some, that's going to take some cash. So. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Uh, Ron or, uh, or Helen, do you anything to add to that? Well, well, I think, I mean, like, <laughs> Zhang Yisau also make use of the money to keep on expanding his navy ah. or fleet, obviously, because what we can see is that even though it, isn't, it wasn't on record, but as, as we can see from the growing size of uh, confederations, I mean, you need the cash, you need money. And it is actually quite expensive to, to maintain a huge navy I mean, in, the, in the 18th century or the, at the turn of the 18th century, because mm -hmm. you need to repair the ship, I mean, every, every now and then. And then there were lots of like various 
climatic challenges. I mean, when you sail in the high sea, I mean, that you have to make sure that your ship is in good shape and right. your weapons, your cannons, I mean, they're all costly. They all cost you money. So I think, I mean, at least part of the booties, I'm sure that Zhang Yisa will allocate it to the expansion of his own enterprise. Right. Um, Helen, back to you for a sec. Um, like your book, when did it come out? It came out in March 2020. So Ooh. it was the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> Ooch. Uh, what, yeah. what, what sort of feedback? Because I think it's really interesting. Um, I know as a, a kid myself, like some historical books, sometimes they're very dry. Uh, so to find something that is historical, but historical fiction, or even something like, um, like Robert Graves, uh, Claudius, the God. I mean, I love that kind of thing because it can get you into the story and the history without it being dry. So I wonder what your the reaction or feedback you've had uh, for your book. Well, uh, it's generally been quite positive. We're in a, a very much a golden era of children's publishing right now. Mm -hmm. And um, when the internet, started, you know, back then, it basically killed children's nonfiction for a while because mm. publishers were like, well, what are we going to do? And you know, exactly like what you're saying, the nonfiction books of our youth were very dry. They were, you know, compendiums of facts. Well, they were all of a sudden rendered obsolete. You don't need them anymore because you can get every fact you want like that on the internet. So the, um, the whole industry had to shift and think about, well, what do we really want? What's going to be in a book that's going to work? Mm. And it was a few different things, one of which was a synthesis of all kinds of different things. So you don't, you know, the, the research that I have to do for a book uh, about like someone like, um, like this is much deeper and, than you can just do on the internet. You know, you're not going to find it, right? That's, as you know, from looking, you find myths, you find all kinds of stuff, but that's not real. Or in, other books where you have to take things from different disciplines and, and put them together. And the other thing is that the books are definitely focused on story, even ones that are not narrative. Every nonfiction book has some kind of story that it's telling, something that needs to pull you through the story and keep you reading, turning the page. It's very different. It's not about educating. It's not about delivering facts. It's about inspiring readers yeah. to go on their own journey. So what I know is that when people hear this story, whether they're children or adults, they are captivated. That's what I was aiming for. I want you to feel when you read the story, the way I felt when I first learned about her and got to know. And I want you to know as well that she did this against so many odds. What odds are we facing? You know, we still are living in societies that are male dominated or, you know, that are racist in their ways. And um, we have to overcome. So what skills did she have? What did she bring to the table that we can use as, as a role model? Now, I'm not suggesting that we go out and, and rob the high seas, <laughs> but- Oh, come on, it sounds fun. It does, <laughs> and I'm ready. You, you and Emma, <laughs> you me. I know it. Right. I know. We, we, we'll do this together. Right. Uh, but I, you know, you want people to come away in a sense wanting to know more, right? Mm -hmm. You want to know more. Fill in all those blanks. Please do. That's the next step. Great. I mean, it was interesting too. This last year when I had people on about some other female pirates, uh, like I said, Bonnie and Reed and Grace O'Malley. Um, and I remember they a couple of the speakers, they did a play, they wrote a play about uh, Bonnie and Reed, and they Mm -hmm. when they were going around people were saying female pirates female pirates really and there are quite a few um but yeah again it's like why uh, ron said he heard about her when he was 10 in hong kong but like it's hard to find these stories they are coming out it's great that people are writing about them but um often again whitewash or they don't fit into the to the idea of what the victors want to give across so they kind of get whitewashed right so this is a really important point and it's something that we as as children's writers that we're very very conscious of and when i go into a classroom or a school i point out to people that you know this is why we need to be able to read and write and speak well because if you don't have the ability to tell your story or the stories that interest you they will not get told you know it's perfectly natural why did i write 
about the Pirate Queen or Katherine Johnson or Wendy Sloboda or any of the other people I've written about because I'm a woman and I wanted to tell these stories. And you need to be able to do that. If you expect other people with different biases and different outlooks on life and different interests, you know, you cannot expect them to do justice to you. We are responsible for our own stories. So now in children's books, you know, so many women are writing, so many librarians are women, that we're starting to finally see the representation because none of us grew up knowing that there were women who not only could do the things, we kind of knew that, but they did. They did. They did them all. And most of the time, women's accomplishments were taken from them and um, uh, acquired by men who called it you know, their own, mm-hmm. or just like in the case of, of our heroine today, just to completely smush down. So when I was in Guangzhou, I was at uh, school there, and my son was actually living there at that point. He was there for four years. Oh. And nobody knew her. Nobody in Guangzhou knew her name at all but they knew her husband and they knew her son, neither of which were as amazing, right? I'm not to take anything away from them, but she kind of was like, she really the top one. dog. Yeah. yeah. And you think it doesn't fit the narrative of the people who are in charge. Right. Tell right. the story about the woman who overcame and subverted the social order. OK, brilliant. So can we say, because I'm, I'm aware of the time here, guys, can we say that uh, uh, Zhang Yisao, she dominated the Chinese coast for a decade on land as well as sea. Her power rivaled the emperor himself. And as time and time again, she triumphed over quite a few of the emperor's ships. Uh, she's quite a pest. Um, um, and so if I go back to Ron and Diane there, so around, I think, eight. 1909, the government began to view them as rebels. Ron, do you want to take over? Well, the rhetoric against them didn't change. They were always uh-huh. called Hai Fei, Yang Fei. Um, but I don't think we can, we can't over exaggerate her power. She had dominance, and, and, and it wasn't she alone, it was the Confederation, and she could not have done it had there not been an awful lot of male workers and male uh, captains and, and, and mates and various uh, officers on each vessel and many vessels in, you know, in each fleet mm-hmm. and, and her unity of that. So it's fair to say that the pirates dominated the South China coast for about a decade. And that in 189, um, they were reaching the apogee of their power, but they were also on the brink of their demise. And their demise occurred not because of any foreign uh, interference so far as I can tell. Um, it The main reason seems to have been the fact that in the late, in November of 189, the pirates were blockaded in, in, in what is now the area where the Hong Kong airport is. Um, that was the bay and there was an island at the tip of the bay and it made a nice headquarters for, for the pirates. They were careening their vessels and cleaning up part of part of Zhang Bao's fleet and the government forces. And, and at this point, the government had allied with six Portuguese men of war and they were gonna come and blockade them in, which they did. This was a, a, a strenuous moment, but it was not fatal. The pirates ended up you know, suppressing that, sending the fleet away, the pirates escaped. But during that period, the leader of the Red Jungbao asked the leader of the Black, Fla- uh, Black Flag Fleet for aid. He refused and intentions that had been kind of there from the beginning burst open. And afterwards, in December, there was a big battle between the red and the black fleets. The Mm. black fleet surprisingly won. And after that, they were very serious about taking advantage of a government's offer of amnesty and decided Mm. to surrender to the government. It was a long process. They had to prove their sincerity by bringing Uh in other pirates, Uh, but, but they, they surrendered. And at that time, some of uh, the Red Squadron uh, men also surrendered. And so things were, things were tense. And Zhang Bao said, no, 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 I'm not gonna, we're not gonna surrender. But as time went on, they too 
began to sense the handwriting on the wall. Okay. And, and so uh, measures were taken. Uh, long story yeah. short, the surrender finally took place of, of basically the Red Fleet in April of 1810. And, uh, yeah. One of the things, and again, I don't know if it's uh, strictly true or not, but um, maybe Ron can fill us in here. Um, and I, I love this story, whether it's true or not. She went to the palace with uh, like a whole lot of children and, <clears throat> and other women and, and sort of made a deal with them or made a pact with them. Um, is that mm. true? Well, yeah, well, so... <laughs> Once again, it's, it's really hard to, to say whether they're, they're, they're factual stories, but okay. because there are lots of rumors, I mean, especially when it comes to pirates. I mean, so it's, we have to be very careful I mean, to really say whether this is a, a very <laughs> fake news or, or not a fact. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but but what I, I also want to go back very quickly, I mean, to mm -hmm. what Diane just mentioned, just to add some footnotes there, is yeah. that because the Qing government, I mean, also realized that the, the tension uh, within the pirate clans at that time they know that they were fighting each other okay. so instead of like fighting them directly in the sea i mean the chain court i mean actually try to use some tactics like divide and conquer i mean mm -hmm. to talk to some pirate leaders individually and then to offer them a, a fairly good retirement plan and, <laughs> and, 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 and so as, as, a, as a way to attract them to sort of like surrender and yeah. because after all after all i mean uh, it, it was not always uh, uh the first option i mean for for, for these pirates I mean, to become pirates in the mm -hmm. Chinese mindset, I mean, if we go back to those like, like the, the Chinese traditions, because and and it was there were no no one was born to be a pirate, um, and 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 even Zhang Baozai, I mean, eventually he decided to surrender to the Qing court, and he himself, I mean, he written that I mean he was only forced to become a pirate, mm -hmm. so it was never it was never his dream job whatsoever, um, so that's why the Qing was also aware of the fact that I mean, uh, not everybody wants to become pirates. And so as a result, I mean, the pirates were willing to retire on their own terms, I mean, when the times comes. So, but, yeah. but, but it didn't come <laughs> easily because the original, mm -hmm. the original discussions were taking place in February, mm. I believe, of 1810. And they broke mm. down because there was a difficulty. The pirates, uh, Zhang Bao wanted to keep a certain number of vessels and be mm. a participant in the salt trade. So things went awry. And then according to, uh, according to what I discovered, I think it was in the archives, she then went with 17 other uh, pirate women and children to the, not to the emperor. No, okay. this is, they, they don't go that high. We're not, they're not getting down Guangdong. This is to the governor general's Yaman in Canton. Right. And there the negotiations apparently were worked out, but. It's not clear to me whether this delegation also included some pirate male pirate leaders or whether it was strictly all female. But but that's the point then that uh, things turned around and Zhang Bao was allowed to keep a certain number of vessels and participate mm -hmm. in the salt trade. I mean, I'm sorry, not the salt trade in the uh, <laughs> yeah in the salt trade, <laughs> in the salt trade <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then to go on and become a military official. So right. you know. I, yep. I, I like that. I like the fact that she had enough um, yep. cojones, let's say, to go and meet it, meet the governor general or the, you know, the highest power that she mm. was going to see. And uh, she got a good deal as well. It was like, you know, um, yeah. she, she was obviously yeah. very very good strategist she was obviously very good uh, media yeah, yeah. and indeed indeed <clears throat> and one of the outcomes i mean of the negotiation is that I mean, like also zhang bao zhang bao zai and zhang yi sao were allowed to marry officially i mean contrary mm -hmm. to the chinese law at that time so it was mm -hmm. like a it was like a romantic happy ending <laughs> towards the end don't we love that though the, the couple <laughs> brilliant i love that um and do they stay together well, yes, yes, they did. They yeah. did. They did. Did, they, did she have any children? <laughs> mm -hmm. She did. A son. A son. A son with, with him. Yeah, mm -hmm. with John Baozai. Yeah. John Baozai. Um, she also is, I don't know if this is true or not, did she become an advisor to the government? Mm, no. Not that he, we know. He, be, 
he became a military official. And what's interesting about that is he was in the Pescadores. And there's this guy named <laughs> Linzi Shu, who people who know Chinese history a little bit about the Opium War. He's the guy that destroyed that British, the chest of British opium at the outset of the Opium War, or at the outset of conflict in, in 18, what, 29 or huh. uh, 39. And anyway, he was a rising official at that time. And he saw Zhang Bao's rise through the ranks. And Zhang Bao was about to become a, a brigade general, brigadier general, that's pretty high position. So he blew the whistle and said, hey, you can't have this, you know, this ex-pirate rising like this. And, and before, I think if I, before that whole enterprise got resolved, Zhang, Zhang Bao died and he died at a fairly young age. And, and then she went back to, to Guang, Guang, uh, Guangdong, but she later I got into it again, I think, with him over her privileges as an official's wife, which she was claiming. And then there was some kind of an allocation that somebody had borrowed money from him and that from Zhang Bao and that hadn't it hadn't been paid back. And there was a lawsuit. Apparently she lost. But I think Linda Xu may have been involved in that as well. <laughs> but she, she didn't just lay down her sword and her pirate flag. I believe she opened a casino. <laughs> Is that true or not? <laughs> Maybe a gambling house. I mean, a like a small house. gambling house. Okay. Because you know, maybe too like large okay. scale. Um, okay. A small gambling yeah. house. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Macau hadn't been. Macau was <laughs> the gambling den of the Orient at that point. Right. So it was, it was a pretty lucrative uh, little trade to be in, I guess. She was still making some money. She's still a bit of a wheeler dealer, um, <clears throat> and in charge of her own life, by the sounds of it. So what do we know? What age she died and where she died? Sixty-nine at the. Uh, 69, 1844 69. is what is what I have. I don't you know. Yeah. And in 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 Guangzhou or Canton. So I've got a question from one of our participants, uh, Anika. Thank you, Anika. She is asking, did uh, Zhang Yisao interact with the East India Trading Company or engage in the opium trade and said, thank you so much for holding this talk. I'm focusing on piracy in the South China Sea for my dissertation. So it's very helpful. Well, thank you, Anika, uh, for asking the question. Who would like to take that question? I think so. And the, here's, here's my evidence. Prior to about 1796, there were, I, I read, uh, there were indications that pirates, petty pirates and pirates were interfering with the British opium trade in China. And then the record goes silent. And then I think it's again in 1810, just about the time that the surrender takes place after that. There is mention again of a pickup in the opium trade and Zhang Bao being involved. And so I think what was happening, I think there was a payoff between the pirates and the EIC and that, you know, there was some money being made there. I can't prove it, but I'm just sure that, that, that yes. And, and, and the pirates were involved in several different ways with the East India Company. A, they captured some of their men, and those men wrote accounts of being captive by the pirates. Um, and there were negotiations, especially in 1810, as the first round of um, surrender talks failed. The pirates really went to the British and asked if they would, you know, support them and they would agree not to attack British vessels. And, and there was, there was uh, contact there. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Um, and I see that we're almost out of time. Uh, and there's a the last question I want to ask the three of you. Um, uh, there's one that's from Gabby Venus. She's, I uh, don't know if it's male or female. Do we know what she may have worn as a female pirate? Any ideas? Oh, that's a good question. Interesting question. <laughs> that's the, only, the only clothing that I have <laughs> heard or seen in any source was that what was it Zhang Bao had on a was it a purple turban and and a oh, oh, oh yeah, glass, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, what was that I can't read it's from Glasspool and I can't quite remember but that is the only 
physical description of any pirate <laughs> in terms of culture <laughs> that aware. I have seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you if you Google Zhang Baozai, because I tried to find a picture of him, I mean, a while back as well. Mm -hmm. If you Google Zhang Baozai, you also see that like like Chinese painting or portrait that mm -hmm. Diane was mentioning. Um, yeah, it was online, so you can see. I mean, how exactly? I mean, Zhang Baozai was dressed. And and I think it was also fairly similar to to Zhang Yisao's like like dress code because they're both pirates. <laughs> Helene, you've got a, a picture there. If you bring it a little bit closer, we can see what so your I pirates. Would say that this is accurate because for the same reason we um, we don't have the information. Mm -hmm. But you have in a picture book, you have to make a decision about <laughs> oh, what someone yeah, yeah. You know, you can't put just a question mark over them. Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, I was delighted to see that Liz Wong, who illustrated this book, Beautiful. put her in sort of a pink tunic and pants just so that she stands out in the crowd. Mm -hmm. and she does. I'm sure. sure it would have been a comfortable outfit. She would not be wearing high heels. She wasn't wearing the bat hat, she didn't have the bound feet. She wouldn't have the modern equivalent, which is stupid high heel shoes. <laughs> well, listen, we have, I know we've got some more questions there, but we've basically run out of time. Um, and I just would like to ask all three of you, if you could just maybe two or three words to describe her. I mean, you've all talked about her, you've written about her. If you could just pick three words, what would they be? If I start with Helene first? I would say she was an operator. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, as, as a kind of an entrepreneur, she was able to always find the angle. She was brilliant as a tactician, as a, as a, you know, CEO of a major corporation of keeping all of these moving parts in. And she was lucky, you know, and which is sort of uh, underscores my whole book is that it was fortune picked her up and shook her. And, you know, you, uh, you never know what's going to happen to you. We all have potentials of different things, but circumstances uh, are not in our control and you have to rise to the challenge or if there is one, but you may not get that challenge. You, you don't may know. Not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Luck is you know. definitely part of everyone's piece of life. Diane, what about yourself? Two or three words, sum her up. Um, profession practical and patient oh three p's lovely and ron there's no p in the ocean though <laughs> <laughs> too much of it i think ron what about you yeah so my pick would be um competent uh mm -hmm. ambitious mm -hmm. and also dangerous <laughs> right yeah i mean i guess she had to have that side to her so that people would yeah. fear her and um, yeah. and maybe so she could control the people. There is Helene. She's got her sword out again. So, yeah. Um, I want to thank you so much uh, for everybody joining um, us this evening. And thank you for your questions. Sorry, I couldn't feel them all. Uh, sorry, I've got a train to catch, so I have to run off soon. Um, but thank you very much to Diane Murray, to uh, Professor Ronald and to author Elaine Becker. And thank you to Ho for managing uh, the Zoom this evening. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. She's a fantastic person. As Helene said earlier, I think stories like hers really inspire um, girls and boys and adults. So um, again, thank you very much. And um, yeah, we'll see you again. I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, Thank's guys. Thank Cheers. Thanks, Hope.